Hi everyone. I'm recording in a new site today. I'm in a conference room on campus. Um, it's about five degrees outside, so the, the heat is going pretty pretty loud in this room, and I, I hope the sound quality is okay. What I'm going to talk about today is confidence intervals for the population mean. Um, it's another type of inference. Remember that inferences are decisions or conclusions that are reached about a population about a population parameter, means or standard deviations, based upon sample data. Okay, so just a little review of the confidence interval for a population mean. Confidence intervals uh, for the mean and the proportions, the other one we're, we've looked at, are based upon the sampling distribution of the mean. If the following three conditions are met, if the random sample is drawn from the population, the sample size is greater than 30 or the population is known to be normally distributed, if the standard deviation of the population is known, then we know some things about the distribution of sample means, which is called the sampling distribution. The, the sampling distribution has a mean that's equal to the population mean, has a standard error, which is also the standard deviation, that's equal to the following expression, which is the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size, and the sampling distribution is approximately normal. The normality is the key here. With normality, we can make decisions. With normality, that we know that within essentially two, it's one, negative 1 1.96 and 1.96, so essentially within two standard deviations of the mean, 95% of the data are expected to fall. Within negative 2.576 and 2.576, so that's about two and a half standard deviations below the mean to two and a half standard deviations above the mean, about 99% of the data are expected to fall. In general, we'll say between some score, z sub c, and some other score, so negative z sub c to z sub c, about c percent of the data. So the the value that that we the number of standard deviations that you go up and down from the mean depends upon the confidence level okay so if we know that sampling distribution of the mean is normal then we are and and we know so we know that that the x bars are normally distributed then we are c percent confident that the that any any given sample mean randomly selected is within z sub c standard deviations of the population mean. So for example, we'd be 95% confident that that the x bar is within 1.96, approximately two standard deviations of the population mean. But that also, if we turn that around, then we're c percent confident that the population mean is within that same number of standard deviations of the sample mean. And from that, we get our confidence interval. We know that the population mean is, should be, we're 95% or 99% confident, there's a 95% chance that the population mean will be within z sub c standard deviations of the sample mean. So that leads to the confidence interval. We start at the sample mean, we go up z sub c, 2 or 2.5, whatever, whatever the confidence level is, standard deviations, and these standard deviations are of the sample mean. Start the sample mean, go up and down, however many standard deviations, and you'll, you'll have a 95 or 99 or 90 percent chance of capturing the population mean. Keep in mind that this is all based on normality, the validity condition for the uh, sampling distribution. Again, random sample of size n, sample size greater than 30, or a population that's known to be normal and a standard deviation of the population is known. That's a key. This last one's a key, which we'll explore and sort of deviate from a little bit in the next couple sessions. All right, so let's look at an example. This is a fairly basic example where the information is given to you. Um, unoccupied seats on flights cause airlines to lose revenue. To estimate the average number of unoccupied seats per flight on all of its flights, the key, that's the parameter the average number of unoccupied seats on all of its flights. That's the population. One airline randomly selects 210 recent flights and notes the number of unoccupied seats for each flight. The sample mean is found to be 11.6 flights per seat. That's on the 210 flights. They have an average of 11.6 unoccupied seats per flight. 
The airline knows from past experience that the standard deviation of the number of unoccupied seats for all its flights, which is our sigma, is 4.1 seats. Use a 99% confidence interval to estimate the mean number of unoccupied seats on all of its flights. Okay, so the sample data gives us a sample mean of 11.6, a sample size of 210. We know the standard deviation of, of the number of unoccupied seats per flight on all flights is 4.1, so that's our sigma. For a 99% confidence interval, we want to go up and down from the mean, 2.576 standard deviations. So up and down that many standard deviations from the sample mean will have a 99% chance of capturing our population mean. So plugging that into the standard to the confidence interval formula, start at the sample mean, go down 2.576 standard deviations of the sample mean, which is the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. Again, that's called the standard error and to start the sample mean and go up 2.576. Remember that 2.576 is linked to the 99% confidence level. These numbers simplify too, and I believe there's a mistake here. I have to look on the next page because I've corrected them. Okay, perhaps there's not a mistake. Sorry, those numbers simplify to 10.87 and 12.33. All right. Now, two last things that I'll ask you to do on, on homework assignments. Um, interpret the interval. Basically, just talk about this interval in terms of the problem, which is, again, three parts. Tell me the confidence level. Tell me the parameter. What are you estimating? And tell me the calculated limits. So for part one, we know the upper and, lo and lower limits of unoccupied seats for this confidence level or interval are 10.87 and 12.33. So here's the interpretation. We are 99% confident that the mean number of unoccupied seats on all flights, that's the population, is between 10.87 and 12.33. Finally, I'll ask you to discuss the validity of this confidence interval. The validity would be based upon against the validity for the sampling distribution of the mean, that making sure it's normal. We have a random sample of 210 flights. The number of flights, 210, is greater than 30. And the standard deviation of unoccupied seats on all flights population standard deviation is known to be 4.1. Because of that, the sampling distribution is normal and the formula is valid. Okay, I want to briefly look at one additional problem. And this one I'm going to use StatCrunch to do a little bit of the work. This is uh, actually from real data from a, from a Kentucky school district. Um, reading recovery in this school district is used to remediate low performing readers. Um, the data are contained in this particular file and they represent independent reading scores at three points in time before students used reading recovery. At the end of 10 weeks, we call that the exit time, and at the end of the school year, we'll call that the end time. So with 95% confidence, we're gonna estimate the impact from beginning to end of 10 weeks on students' mean or average growth on this test using reading recovery. All right, to do that, I need to take a look at the data. And the data are already loaded into, I've already loaded them into StatCrunch. Um, a couple things that you need to do a confidence interval, you need a, a mean and you need a standard deviation. So if you go to Stat and Summary Statistics on a column, okay, pick the column. We want to look at, at the difference, at the growth from exit, from entry into the program to exit, which is at the end of 10 weeks, which is right here. So select that column compute and we see some of the information this isn't all of it but this is this is good for now it says in this column we've got 537 students that were selected here is their sample mean about 11.7 here is their standard deviation of the reading score reading growth scores for these 537 individuals all right so Going back to the data, I've posted the data here. Okay, we have the sample size is 537. The sample mean for these 537 students is about 
Okay, now here's an assumption we're going to make, which for now we're going to make it. Um, later we'll explain that this is still correct. It's just something slightly we have to do different, um, which we'll explore in the next sessions. Um, we're going to make an assumption that the standard deviation of this sample is approximately equal to the standard deviation of growth scores for all students. In other words, we're going to assume that the standard deviation for this sample of students is equal to the standard deviation of the population. We'll use that in the formula. Okay, plugging the values into the formula, we want to construct a 95% confidence level, so the z sub c is 2, meaning essentially 1.96. We go up 1.96 standard deviations and down 1.96 standard deviations. We should capture, have a 95% chance of capturing the true growth score for all students in this district. Okay, so we start at the sample mean, go down 1.96 standard deviations of the sample mean. That equals 11.42. Start the sample mean, go up 1.96 standard deviations, and that gives us 11.97. Okay, again, interpreting this interval, we've got, again, interval limits from part one are 11.42 and 11.97, so we're 95% confident that the mean reading growth score for all students in this district, essentially all students in the past and all in the future who are using reading recovery for this period of 10 weeks is between 11.42 and 11.97 points on this test. Lastly, let's look at the validity of this uh, confidence interval. Again, based on the normality of the sampling distribution, we've got a number of students selected is 537, which is significantly greater than 30. But if you get something that's close to 30, what you would want to do is actually check to make sure, so it's close to 30, if you have a sample size that's close to 30, say 40 or even 50, you want to make sure that the data are normally distributed. So if you go back to graph and construct a histogram of these reading growth scores, my histogram looks like this, okay? The, the, this is the histogram of growth scores for the sample of 537 students. What this suggests, though, because of, this, because of how normal it is, very normally distributed, this suggests that reading growth scores for all students would be normally distributed. So even if we have a small sample, if our histogram of the sample is fairly normal, we can still use this confidence interval formula. Okay? Um, all right. So a check of the sample, as I said, as we just did, reveals the sample growth scores are normally distributed, which su suggests that growth scores for all students are normally distributed. We made an assumption that standard deviation of reading growth scores for all students is known. Again, that's via our assumption to be 3.29. And lastly, the only sort of quirk in our validity will be the randomness of the sample. Rarely in educational research are samples randomly selected. You don't randomly assign students to, to uh, the reading recovery program. Basically what you do is you select low performing students and have them work through the program. So it's not strictly a random sample. But as long as it can be assumed that the sample of, rec of reading recovery users is representative of all the potential reading recovery users in the district. In other words, we're looking at a population of all low performing readers. Is there any reason to believe that the 537 that we selected is different, is any different than the other potential other ones we could have selected or, or will select in the future? Okay, as long as our sample is, we believe is representative of all reading recovery users in the district, then the violation of randomness is not critical. Okay, thus we have evidence that our use of the confidence interval formula is still valid.